Good evening, everybody. I'm Roy Firestone, and this is Up Close Classic. Tonight, a look at one of sports' most controversial and quotable characters. Don King was the first major African-American boxing promoter and the man who single-handedly controlled the heavyweight division for the better part of three decades. He also spent four years in prison for manslaughter and had his share of other run-ins with the law. King is loud, bombastic, and, of course, never at a loss for words. If you could define yourself seriously, without any of the overuse of the words, the verbosity, in a simple way, what would you say about yourself? Well, let me say this. I'm a guy who loves people. I'm an American. I'm a people guy. I'm a promoter of the people, for the people, and by the people, and my magic lies in my people ties. The most significant thing about me, Roy, is that I bring my own appraiser. This is the major difference. I refuse to allow uh, anybody to appraise me, because, you know, usually the stereotype appraisal of the white to the black is he's no account, he's lethargic, he's slowful, he can't rise to the occasion, he don't do nothing but lie. Now, I don't need to get out of bed if that's what I'm all, except for my appraisal. So I bring my own appraisal to say, look, he's a visionary. He's a guy that's ambitious, he has zeal, he has integrity, he has honesty and commitment and performance. So when I bring this type of performance, I'd be so ebullient, I'd be so exhilarated when I get out of bed. I just, I can hardly wait to get to the office and I can hardly wait to meet people to, to extend myself, ingratiate myself and to make business and perform and make things happen. Now sometimes the fighters say, the fighters now, Don, that you're a great promoter, not the greatest businessman in the world. When the television money doesn't come through, you have to force the fighters to take a cut. But they also add, when there's a big profit to be made, they never see any extra money coming their way. What oh, about that? Oh, Roy, now, now, Roy. <laughs> you must understand that I couldn't even get to the television when I came. You must understand I'm a pioneer and a trailblazer. And so I must be able to deal with whatever unforeseeable contingency arises, whether it comes from behind a tree or under a rock. I must be able to deal with it extemporaneously and deal with it pragmatically and realistically. When I came into the boxing world, they didn't let Mavericks in. They didn't particularly care for white Mavericks. But they didn't let black ones through the portals to the arena. So now I had to go around the world. You have to recall this. Now, before I ever promoted in America, I was promoting in, in uh, the thrill in Manila, the rumble in the jungle. You know, and in, the, in Caracas, Venezuela, I opened up the, the Poliedro. So I bought the prodigal son return home by acclaim because all the major events was going to other countries. In, uh, so therefore, they then let me come home to promote. So I didn't have television then. I was doing it from out there, from governments and from relationships with people all around the world. Now when I come in with television, what a person believes he's worth and what the deal is, is two different things. Mm -hmm. Many fighters have uh, inflated beliefs of their worth, and so they say, you got to cut. The cut means that I have given them what reality pragmatically indicates and dictates, and what they had in their mind was a higher figure. So in their mind, they say it was a cut. I have never cut any fighter. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it's a difference in what they're thinking. If they say, give me 10 million, I say, well, I can't give you but five. You, I'm going to do it for you, but, cost, but you cut me five million. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things go, and that's pervasive in our business, and I understand that. They're great athletes, and I'd love to promote them. And then I revolutionized the pay scale in boxing. I paid fighters more money than anyone in the history of the sport. That is a true fact. You know that, what is, mean? that has been documented. So no when question. I be, what do, all, the only thing I could be guilty of is hitting them in the head with $100 bills, giving them <laughs> dignity, pride, and a lot of money. So now whatever it is is more than what they could get from any adversary of mine. Otherwise, they wouldn't be with me. Let's acknowledge a few mistakes, okay? okay? Dropping Duran. Aaron picks up Duran, makes millions, you let him go, you could have made some more money. Will you acknowledge that one? Yes, that's a mistake from that point of view of money, but from the point of view of love and understanding of a fighter that was my strongest fighter, 10 years with me, he was a champion before Holmes became a champion. I loved him, I thought he had, uh, he had had enough, I wanted him to get out, so I gave him a bonus and told him to retire. He mm -hmm. came back and made a lot of money. U.S. Boxing Championships, ABC Sports, King accused of paying off Ring Magazine, fixed ratings leading to firings at Ring Magazine, it cost officials their jobs. Will you acknowledge that as a mistake? No, that was the greatest contribution I ever made to boxing was the USBA. Uh, these these champion, the U.S. Boxing Championships, these championships gave everybody across the nation a, an opportunity to win by the merit of their talent and ability. Uh, to become a, a United States champion to give us a nationalistic flavor su such as we had a world flavor from the Olympics here uh, just a few, uh, just yesterday. Mm -hmm. So what happened there is uh, my detractors, they all began to shoot in your windows and insinuations. That calls for a problem. But I, did, I don't rate fighters in the ring magazine, nor do I have judges or officials. So I just promote the fights and I gave the opportunity to American boys. You charged Bob Arum with being the apostle of apartheid for promoting 
the fight with Jerry Coetzee, but now it looks like Don King might promote that fight. Would that be a mistake? On the contrary, I call Aram the apostle of apartheid because he goes to South Africa and he was promoting when everybody uh, is against uh, the abominable policy of apartheid that is practiced in South Africa. Uh, Jerry Coetzee has came to the United States. He lives here in California. He has denounced apartheid. You cannot blame a man for the station of his birth. You must be able to try to help him as you would anyone else as long as he does not continue to uh, carry on the type of apartheid uh, policy. Welcome back to Up Close Classic. I'm Roy Firestone. Don King and Mike Tyson. Before Tyson went to prison, the two were seemingly inseparable. And for a time, King was quite literally Tyson's biggest promoter. I want to discuss the, uh, the issue of the perception on the part of the press and some of the public on what Don King did to influence Mike Tyson to, uh, to, to fire Bill Caton, a man who contractually had the rights to manage uh, Mike Tyson. You may debate that, but contractually that was supposedly the case. The perception is that you muscled your way in, that you found a way to get to him, be it money or women or whatever. What about that perception and how do you answer those, those claims? Well, first of all, Roy, they're ludicrous uh, to say that I would muscle my way in or to be a guy that would supply Mike Tyson women as I've been accused of doing, and I, I couldn't get as many uh, women with both my arms wide open as Mike can get on his little finger. Uh, uh, let me say this, too, that uh, it is very difficult for people to accept, and especially those who are the critics, the doomsayers, to see two successful black men come together and work in unity, solidarity, and togetherness. Mm -hmm. I love Mike Tyson, but I see a bigger picture with Mike Tyson than what they see. They're looking at what he's doing now, this instant, as knocking guys out. I look at Mike Tyson as a role model and a symbol to millions of black and Hispanic kids and white as well, but to blacks especially, that are, they need a hero. They're suffering from helplessness and hopelessness and despair within the confines of the ghetto, and they can say, I want to emulate and imitate this young man. I was going to say, on the plus side, the press has written that Don King, if it's anybody, gonna, if anyone's going to do it, will clean up or get Mike Tyson to get his act together because he will not allow Mike Tyson to be running around at 4 o'clock in the morning at Dapper Dan's, etc. And if you notice, since Don King influenced Tyson of late, the last several months, you hear fewer and fewer incidents involving Mike Tyson. Well, let me say that I, I don't try to control Mike Tyson. This right. is where the difference is, and, and I want to correct one other thing. I have never tried to influence Mike Tyson uh, to get rid of Bill Caden. I've always told Bill Caden that I want to work with him in the spirit of Team Tyson, what's best for Mike, right. and Bill Caden refused to accept that. And uh, Bill Caden just totally disrespected Mike as a man and a human being. So he wanted him a slave or some chattel. So that's what caused the confusion there. Mm -hmm. My way of doing, dealing with Mike Tyson is like a human being. Mike is a very brilliant young man. Many people underestimate mm -hmm. him uh, uh, tremendously. I speak with Mike Tyson. I share my knowledge of 57 years with Mike Tyson. And I, allow, I give him the opportunity and the prerogative to make his own decision. Mm -hmm. See, so I tell him the pro and the con, and then he makes the decision for himself. Boxing 1989, brand new magazine just out, had a uh, pretty brutal assessment of the King-Tyson um, relationship. And this was uh, just part of the quote. Don King will break Mike Tyson's wallet, and when Tyson sees through King's smokescreen, Mike Tyson will feel used and abused. What's your reaction to that? Well, my reaction to that is just, it's just like they all do. Everybody is trying to castigate, ostracize, uh, accuse of what my intentions are with Mike. What me and Mike Tyson has is a love affair of understanding. You know, people that both of us come from the bowels of the ghetto, we're two failures that became successes. Mm -hmm. That's what they would rate us to be. And so we refuse to acquiesce to uh, this type of uh, uh, accusations and allegations and people that are saying what we're doing. We will be recognized and appreciated by what we do. And you can see now that Mike is maturing. He's much more subtle. He's, he's moving along because he's getting understanding. He's getting an opportunity to ask questions and then get the answers for them and then be able to choose what he want, which direction he wants to go. I'm very proud of Mike. You know, and I mean, I look, everybody said 270 pounds, 265. You see him now at 220. And it's almost like a miracle. It's miraculous. So you have to be able to learn to diet with Mike Tyson, learn to eat like Mike Tyson eats. And he's he got can, a video he, out, by he the way. Be a, he's going to be a book. And he's, and he's Get ready to put that together because he's demonstrated by action and deed 
that a man can lose weight, look good, feel good, and he feels good with himself. And, he, and I'm just happy for him, and I'm so happy for the kids that are going to try to emulate and imitate him. And that's what's so vitally important, because we need role models and heroes in the black community, and Mike Tyson is that. Before we go, forgive the cynicism, but it would be understandable, <clears throat> excuse me, if you were in it to make a profit. This is the American way. But oh, truly, I love this country. This is a great nation. I know, I know, I know, Don. Only in America, right? Truly, though, what's in it for Don King? I mean, you stand to make a hefty percentage in some capacity, be it advisor, be it promoter, be it manager, some way you can do it. Uh, you're not supposed to be promoter and manager. But what is in it for you financially? Well, the, 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 the spiritually redeeming factor here for me is to see him grow to mature, to be a great man, a great champion, and more importantly, a great human being that loves all people. The fact that, is, uh, that I'm doing this is that I'm doing it for nothing. And people don't understand, I was there for Mike when Mike needed me, and Mike is there for me. In the future, if Mike starts to fight, and when he fights, I get paid. But there's a thing here that if he don't ever fight, he's still my man. You understand me? And I don't, have need, I don't need a co-signer. I don't need no one to tell me what I need to do. I deal with him because I love to deal with him. I want to help him. And I've done a great job of helping him. And he has been a great person to come out with the help. And he's demonstrating that he can stand by me. So what's in it for me is that when I see the, the millions of kids that are in that ghetto, that can finally find a heavyweight champion that could communicate, relate, identify with the masses of the people and to do so with uh, the type of pride and dignity that Mike asserts with self-reliance, self-determination and, and the conviction within himself that he is somebody and he will be somebody and to see that refined, honed and sophisticated is a great, great thing for me because if Mike Tyson left me today, I would only lose Mike Tyson. But if he stays, then we will gain a million kids that will get a chance to see what a great man he can be. And that's mm -hmm. what I want to work with, for a better America when a guy like Mike Tyson. This is a great country, man. Welcome back to Up Close Classic. I'm Roy Firestone. Two years after his release from prison on manslaughter charges, Don King was a millionaire. Then in 1985, he was the target of a federal investigation into tax evasion and fraud charges. But it seems he's always had a way of bouncing back from adversity. Is Don King's career at least in jeopardy because of this investigation? Well, it, let me say this, Roy. First of all, let me say how sincere I feel about this country. It's just great to be an American. Mm -hmm. Only in America could Don King happen. No place else. So therefore, I feel that when the price of liberty, and it's what we treasure so much, the safeguards of liberty in our Constitution, is what makes us a mile apart between any other nation. Uh, recognize the fact that if I was accused, indicted of anything in Russia, the KGB would have swooped me up and taken me away. It wouldn't have been no case, no due process. If I was in apartheid South Africa, there's no redress or no recourse. There's no means of defense being a black South African. Mm -hmm. you, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. The same thing as what they're saying about Israel between the Middle East. Boy, they don't exist. and They resent that. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm here in America where you have the right to due process. You know, sometimes uh, it aberrates from the norm and the erosion of personal liberties, and I'm a victim of that aberration. However, to have this right to be able to have life living in pursuit of happiness, I have to take that on the chin, too. And, and in tradition of America, I must go out and pioneer to uh, clean my name and vindicate my name. As you said, you heard about the FBI sting that they tried to lay on me. Uh, Many years ago, throughout the time you know me, I've always said that I've never done anything wrong, and if anything happens to me, I'm going to be framed. Mm -hmm. uh, never knowing that in true essence of life that this type of act, unsavory and unscrupulous act, would take place, it did. It was, it was exposed in the papers. All right, let's discuss this for a second. One time we're discussing the FBI in a sting operation, a self-admitted sting operation, trying to get some, something on Don King. There have been allegations that... Your sometimes arch foe, Bob Arum, from his days when he worked with the FBI, may have tried to finger King. He may have tried to get his, his, essentially his competition out of the way by using his friends from the FBI to try to try and nail you. You think that might be true? Well, all those are possibilities. I, I, you know, to, to see that it comes from your mind to be able to say that, I mean, it must be some thought or some conversation that is permeating uh, the countryside to that effect. However, I don't want to deal with that. I want to deal with performing. I'm a performer. In spite of, recognize this, in spite of the insurmountable difficulties and impediments that, that, that comes across my path, I continue to perform more successful than any promoter in the history of the world and collectively more than any contemporary promoter now. So this investigation hasn't cut back your, your action right now? No, not for a true pioneer American because you must be able to deal with 
extemporaneously with whatever comes from behind the tree or from one under the rock. And you must be able to deal and continue to persevere. That's why it's so synonymous with the title that I put, Perseverance on the Fight for Larry Holmes on March 15th, which will be his last. Uh, it's synonymous with our careers, my career and his, perseverance, steadfastness, tenaciousness, uh, faith in God, and in, de in delivering and performing. Determination is what makes it happen. Okay, if, hypothetical, if the unthinkable happens, and they do have something on Don King, again, hypothetical, and they want to either try to put you away or put you out of boxing, what would you do? Well, what you, what you, when, when it happens to a person like me, and I have to laugh, Roy, because you, you know, you, you really, you, you titulate my fancy when you say that. There's nothing can be found wrong with me. I have not done anything other than revolutionize the sport of boxing, pay more money to fighters than ever been paid in the history of the world, put a new glamour, a new type of flamboyance to the sport to give it a little grandeur, a little dignity and pride to the youngsters that are fighting, made more millionaires out of prize fighters than anyone in the history of the world has ever done. Now I'm going to do the same thing with the movie stars. I'm going to find new money that there's, there hasn't been there. Just went into a deal with Jerry Buss to put on the journey of the stars, major boxing here in the fabulous form in Los Angeles. The question, answer the question. The about question is, I don't deal with failure. Totally eradicated okay. out my vocabulary. Okay. Set back every now and then. Failure never. Okay. I will continue to persevere in the American way. All right. This is my country, my, and I love it. My country, tis of thee, sweet land of liberty. We know the rest of the lyrics, okay. Oh, you don't know mine. Of <laughs> thee, I work, I sing, and I pray. This is a great country, and competition is what makes business. And I think everybody should be able to share. It's enough for everybody. Mm -hmm. I've, never had, I've never had any type of uh, misgivings or mixed emotions about the Duvas and the Arams and... Uh, None with the, the Arams. No, well, you know, misgivings, no, because he should be there. Arams should be entitled to an opportunity in the land of opportunity to make a living. I think I would never know how good I really am if I didn't have them as a barometer to be compared with. Mm -hmm. So it's always great to have competition. Without that, I wouldn't have had a chance. You know, you know, this is the last vestige of the free enterprise system, which is boxing. And in a country where you have an opportunity to participate by your merits of your ability and talent, um, it demonstrates indicatively what you can do. So only in America could a Don King happen, and I'm proud to be an American, so I'm really moving straight ahead. Welcome back. The Rumble in the Jungle and the Thrilla in Manila, just two of the fights that helped put Don King on the map. During his 30-plus years in boxing, King's been associated with some of the most famous fights, as well as the biggest names in the sport. We're going to talk about one of the guys that really got you going in this business. George Foreman's actually going to take a fight a week from today at age 39, and at weight around 270, hasn't had a fight in seven, eight, nine, ten years. It's a little ridiculous in the minds of some people. You think he should be allowed to fight at that 30, at 39 and all those conditions? Um, again, uh, Roy, this is what makes this country so unique, rare, and wonderful. Nowhere else can he do this, you know. And um, in America, you have an opportunity to make freedom of choice. George Foreman is a formidable fighter. Look at him. Wait a minute. What do you mean formidable? Look at him right now. You're talking about a guy who's 270 who hasn't had a fight in the 10, 11 years. Why do you say he's formidable? Because he can punch so hard, you know, and this is what, this is what uh, the difference of a George Foreman coming back vis-a-vis -vis another guy. With those type of devastation punches that George's throw, if he still have that type of potency and strength, he'd knock guys out. You know what I mean? So it's, uh, he ain't like the average guy that come in there to get beat boxing around the ring. He goes in there to try to knock him out and take him out. It would be interesting. Uh, uh, I can't say that I recommend it or, you know, that I would uh, suggest that it happen. But nevertheless, again, and it may not be to the fans' liking. It may not be to my liking. But you have that privilege, as Sugar Ray Leonard has, because all of the fans from sentimentality say, Ray, don't do it. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, uh, but he, in America, you have an opportunity to be able to make that choice. And, and he's doing it, and you say, go along with me. This is my personal choice. Please accept it as the best it can, as, as you can, you know? But you see, you brought up the issue of going at it when you shouldn't, perhaps, or when you're past your prime, or when you're leaving yourself open to injury, permanent injury. As we look back and reflect at a picture from 15 years ago or 14 years ago, you and Ali after the Norton fight, I wonder if you now look at his condition these days. And look at he's, my hair. Look at my yeah. hair, man, how dark it is. Yeah. Wow. No, but seriously, going back now, looking at Ali's condition these days, and I, I know you, and you shouldn't feel guilty about how, how it is, but I wonder if you feel in terms of the dark side of boxing that in some way the whole of the sport contributed to his downfall. 
No, not at all. In fact, on the, on the contrary, I'm very proud of Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali's wit is just as sharp as it ever was. His man is sharp. Ali has a disease called Parkinson's syndrome, which has attacked the nervous system. Uh, it also has done it, ironically enough, the same as Howard Cosell. So, you know, it's ironic that these two guys who catapulted, you know, uh, each other into prominence and came along at the same time synonymously, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's one of those things that happen. But Ali is not punch drunk. See, that's what many people think is, oh, look at him, he can't talk, he's slurring his words, he's slow. It's because Ali feels like, you know, he don't have, the, he's not marching to that drum that he usually marks the applause of the crowd. His wit is good, he gives me advice, he's one of my top uh, advisors and cons counselors in promotion. He's there at ringside with me in every fight. And if he takes his medicine, he's, he's really good, but he don't like to take his medicine, which we have to keep admonishing him to do so. But it is not no boxing punch drunkness, and that boxing did this. It could have happened to anyone. I don't think Howard Cosell took any punches in the center of the ring, but you see, you see him in the same, and they're both being treated by the same doctors in New York. So it's the thing here, it's just fate and wild things happen, and, but it's seemingly to a guy who was so loquacious, mm -hmm. so outgoing, such a great promoter, such a hero, that uh, it looked like boxing did it to it. Now, the thing that's intriguing to me regarding Larry Holmes is that there's been a, I don't want to say love-hate relationship, that may, may be unfair, but there's been a, a so, shall we say, a roller coaster relationship between King and Holmes. You'll admit that. Well, let me say what I will admit, uh, uh, Roy. Is, is Larry Holmes may have had a problem with me, but I've never had a problem with Larry Holmes. You see, I understand. I've been with Larry Holmes 12 years, and we work very well together, and I know Larry very well. Now, every now and then, teeth are by tongue, and they're the closest thing I know. So, and they get along. So when the prodigal son came home, I welcomed him, and the fatted calf awaited him. Yes, but Larry Holmes really earns you the money, and you pay him the money. I mean, in a certain sense... You, you are really working for him. He's not working for you. Would, you. would you agree with that? No, I would not agree with that. I think that what it is, it's a combination of them both, but you must realize that I was promoting uh, the Rumble in the Jungle with uh, Muhammad Ali, the heavyweight champion of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and from the money that I made working with Muhammad Ali, I then raised Larry Holmes through his whole career. You know, he just became champion in 1978, so I had him six years before he was the champion, you know what I mean? And this is the things that you have to do to work with and subsidize to help a fighter to go into his career. What's he going to have to deal with if, assuming he does retire, with, with the, the lack of the notoriety, the adulation? Do you think it'll be difficult for him? It is difficult for any star that, that goes out there that becomes a superstar and they have the adulation and the applause of the crowd. It is very difficult to give that up. So the transition will be one that I will work very meticulously along with him to make that transition into business life in which he's already begun. He owns a hotel, he owns a, a nightclub, a disco, he owns a restaurant, he owns a sporting goods store, you know, so he's very well economically, you know, uh, comfortable. Mm -hmm. But however, this transition still, even from that, it still takes its toll. So I'm going to be right by his side to help him to continue to reintegrate and have a reintercourse with society that will be meaningful and have a purpose to it. His is the quintessential rags to riches story. As Don King likes to say, only an American. He is truly an original. Thanks for watching Up Close Classic. I'm Roy Firestone. Good night.